this morning I'm speaking on understanding the times. Hallelujah. Amen. Understanding the times. Bible says in First Chronicles chapter 12 verse 32. He says, uh, he was basically talking about all the tribes of Israel, and he gets to the tribe. If you look through all the tribes he spoke about, and that's from probably um, verse um, 24, coming down, this was the smallest tribe. Issachar was the smallest tribe that he spoke about. When people had 20, uh, thousands of people, Issachar had only 200. And he said that, from Issachar, men who understood the th times and knew what Israel should do. They understood the times, and not only did they understand the times, but they knew what to do. Some of us understand the times, but we don't know what to do. But you need to understand the times and also know what to do. Hallelujah. Um, many of us are in church, but we don't know what to do. A lot more don't even know the times that we are in. But Solomon said something. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. We're reading from verse 1 to, I think, 7 or 6. There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. I said there's a time for what? And a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. Verse 8. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war. And a time for peace. Amen. Amen. So it shows you that there's a time to do whatever you have to do. You can't do things anyhow. You can't run when you have to walk. Hallelujah. Amen. You see, there are times people run and dog bites them because they were running. If they had walked, the dog would have kept his peace. When the dog sees that you are running from him, why are you running? He will run after you. Hallelujah. So, I, I don't know where you live and I don't know how, where, where you grew up. But where I grew up, there were some crazy dogs around. Amen. Very crazy ones. Nobody trains them. They do what they like. If you, by mistake, pass by their house when they are hungry, they want something to eat. And they begin to do, don't run. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you run, they'll run after you. Because it's not a time to run. It's a time to walk wisely. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you see, people do the right thing at the wrong times. It is Hamatan. It's only a foolish farmer that will go and plant at this time. There's no rain. If you go and plant at this time, you will lose everything because they won't do well. It needs rain. Hallelujah. Unless maybe you want to use irrigation, 
But even in this season, water is scarce. So you have to use water wisely. So if you don't use water wisely and you, even you do irrigation, I mean, you begin to really use extensive water around this time, you will be short of water, even for your irrigation. So we have to be very, very wise to know the times we are in and what we have to do. That is why there's a time to dance, but there's also a time to mourn. You can't, when your mother is dead, you can't dance. Hallelujah. Because that's not the time for dancing. It's time to mourn. You, but people do things they don't have to do at times that they don't have to do it. And they want everybody to believe that they did the right thing. Amen. Amen. Ecclesiastes 8 6. Now, Solomon has said there's a time to do whatever you have to do. But now he qualifies it. He says, For there's a proper time and procedure for every matter. Though a person may be weighed down by misery. <laughs> Listen to me carefully. For there is a proper time and procedure for every matter. Though a person may be weighed down by misery. Listen to me carefully. The fact that you are weighed down by misery doesn't mean that if it's not the right time, you're going to do whatever you want to do. It doesn't matter what you are going through. Do the right thing at the right time. But that's not what we do. We look at our circumstance and our situation and begin to act. And we do the wrong things. At times, we don't have to do them because of our circumstance. Hallelujah. Amen. So he says that there is a proper time. Not every time is a time. There is a proper time and a procedure for every matter. The fact that you are weighed down by misery, the fact that you are going through crisis, the, time, the, the fact that you are struggling doesn't mean that you have to go and do the wrong thing. What you are going through should not push you to do what you don't have to do. What you are going through does not allow you to go according to your own procedure, not the laid down procedure. You see, God is God and he can intervene and do what he wants to do at any time. And he will do it. Amen. Amen. She's known this person for heaven knows how long. And interestingly, let me tell you something. <laughs> when she was telling me the story about her testimony, she said, this person has lost the dad and there's a funeral coming. It's not time to give gifts. It's Ghana funeral. Ghana funeral, we need cash. You see, Ghana funeral is not about only coffin. The coffin is a small part. It's the party that matters. Hallelujah. Because now, let me tell you something. Today, and she's coming from somewhere. She's not like a resident in Ghana. So the expectations are higher. In today's time, let, let me tell you, if you haven't gone for funerals recently, I'm going to tell you something that will surprise you. Do you know that we have times of breakfast? Breakfast before barrier. I don't know when they cry. <laughs> Even funerals, we have after parties. We have lunch for some people, but we have special dinners 
for some selected people as well. Who cries at dinners? Who cries at lunches? We, we enjoy. When your mother is dead or your dad is dead, you have to cry. Mourn. But we've turned it. We are dancing. Time for mourning. We've turned it to a time of dancing. Let me tell you something. Look, who are on the side? If you die, Ghanaians will eat and dance. They won't cry. People are dying too much. If we begin to cry plenty, our tears will finish. Hallelujah. No, I want you to understand the reality now. The reason you have to prepare. Because if you think you are going to die for people to cry, forget it. Forget it. You yourself, the last, when was the last time you cried at a funeral? That you want somebody to come and cry at your funeral? Nobody's going to cry. Why? Because we have begun to do wrong things at the right time. The times we're supposed to do the things we don't do. We are doing, you see, dancing is supposed to be at times that we are celebrating. So now, you know what we have done? Instead of talking about obituaries, we are talking about celebration of life. So we can have time to party and dance. You haven't gotten that one. How many people do you see? They write, celebration of life. How can they celebrate if they don't write celebration? So they have to find something. If you are coming for mourning, you are going to spoil our party. So we tell you before you come, we are going to celebrate. But that's not time for celebration. It's time for mourning. And so today, people kill people and they don't care. Because it's no longer painful for people to die. We've turned everything. So it's, there's no proper time for anything again. If it suits you, do it. But Bible says that there's a proper time and procedure for every matter. There's a procedure for every matter. It doesn't depend on what you are going through. There's a proper time and there's a procedure. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, Jesus says something in John chapter 7, I think verse 6. He said, therefore Jesus told them, my time is not here here. For you, any time will do because you don't have any plan. We do things anyhow. Anyhow, because we don't even, we are not like the, uh, um, the tribe of Issachar. We don't know, we don't understand the times. We don't understand the seasons we are in. We don't understand. I want you to really pay attention because we need to understand the times we are in so that you do the right things at the right times. People are doing the right things at the wrong times. Hallelujah. And people are doing wrong things at the right times. Hallelujah. When they have to do the thing, they won't do. They will do it at another time when that time is for something else. I want you to pay attention. Because I have seen it under the sun. And in our time, people are just doing anything, anyhow. We are living our lives like there is nothing at stake. That's how we live in our lives now. Jesus doesn't matter to us anymore. Jesus, it doesn't matter to us anymore. What is important for us is to come to church and pray for money. Instead of crying for souls that are perishing, we come to meetings and everything that we are thinking about is money. So we want to pray for money. In fact, when people come to prayer meetings and then you see that consistently we are praying 
for how we can grow, how we can, uh, they won't come again. Tell me that's not true. They won't come. They won't come. They want, what they want is for them to come, you shout and do everything, and then you just tell them that they are going to be rich. Riches that never comes. Deception. We live in a lie. Hallelujah. So everything in our mind is really like scheduled and purposed for money. Money, 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 money. The times we are in, look, I tell people, if you are going to marry me, I will tell you, you can do what you want to do. But me, I will tell you, that long train is useless. You don't need it. You don't need it. Then people from year to year, half of them are filled with demons and they follow your marriage. You don't even know where they are coming from. You just gather people. And they are following you. Me, I'm telling you. Look, I can't stop you because it's not my marriage, it's your marriage. But I will advise you. I will advise you. <laughs> because, you see, we need to understand... Look, Bible says something. You have to do the right things at the right time. We're talking about timing. It is not the time to sit in church and browse on your phone. Let me tell you something. It's so disrespectful to God. So disrespectful to God. You can't do that before your boss. But you, are, you dare do that before God. Let your boss call you for a meeting. And go and sit. When he's talking, you are browsing your phone. You are terminated. Go home. You don't know what you are doing. You have the time to browse your phone. And you have time to listen to your boss. You have time to listen to the word of God. And you have time to reply to WhatsApp messages. It's not time. It's not a church time. It's not. It's not. It's so disrespectful. I will repeat it because it's become the norm. Look, and most, if you watch uh, preaching online, most time the camera is going around and people are just making, taking selfies when the pastor is preaching. When the pastor is preaching. Look, your phone has become your God. Your phone has become your God and you need to deal with it. We're talking about time, understanding the times we are in. This is not a time, but because we, we are doing everything at any time, everything goes. Christians don't respect God any longer. There's no respect for God. No respect whatsoever. So we do anything we want to do without thinking about God. Without even thinking about where we are. That's what I'm saying. We dance when our mothers die instead of crying and mourning. Because we've come to a time mothers don't mean anything to us any longer. Hallelujah. Hmm. I want us to really get serious. We are not in good times. The times we are in are times that we need to set up and begin to focus. Because if we don't do those things, the right things at this time, look, the Lord is coming like a thief in the night. When is he coming? I don't know. I don't know. But he's coming. It doesn't matter whether you believe it or you don't believe it. He's coming. And he's coming like a thief in the night. He's coming at a time that you don't know. Today, it's about parties. It's about having fun. It's about pleasures. And you know, last week I was telling you about Luke chapter 8, verse 14. 
what really is making us as Christians, what is making us or what is really causing us to be unfruitful. And Bible says that there are, look list three things. He says, life's worries, riches, and pleasures. We are, you see, it, it, we look like, even in church, let, my goodness, let me tell you this. The, the, the praise time in church has become entertainment time. How many of us dance during praises thinking about God? I'm not saying don't dance, but David danced with a purpose. And we say, but David danced until, are you dancing in the same way? Are you, where is your mind when you are dancing? Who are you focused on when you are dancing in church? Pleasures. We brought it into church. We brought it into church. So everything about us is about how, what will make us feel good. Not what will please the Lord. Hallelujah. And, and we need to pay attention. We need to pay attention. Why am I saying we need to pay attention? Because it's scary what's happening around us. Jesus spoke about this in Luke chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 24. Let's read from verse 36 or 37. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Nor your mother, nor your father, nor your pastor, nor your uncle. Nor, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. Stop listening to what people are saying. Nobody knows. I don't know. But we know by looking at the seasons that it is near. But we don't know the exact time. And he says that, go to the next verse. As it was in the days of Noah. Look, I am here this morning to warn you. Because we are behaving as the days of Noah. So even... You know, when people are coming to marry in church, the way they come in, they forget they are coming to the presence of God. It's my day. So I have to come naked or half naked. So we sit in church. We come to the altar of God. When God, Adam and Eve sinned and they realized they were naked, they hid themselves. And they found something to cover themselves. And when God came, God saw that they were not well covered. So he killed an animal and then covered them properly. Now you come to God exposing yourself. May God have mercy on you. And then they say, it's my day. It's your death. It's your death. Go and ask Adam and Eve. When they realized they were naked, they couldn't go before God naked. They covered themselves. But you, then you come half naked. Then you come and stand before a pastor. I pray to God that you won't do that. Because when I see you coming with that, I will tell you, go and see your seamstress before you come here. Or whosoever made that dress for you. I'm, no, I'm telling you the reality. I'm not going to really tolerate it. I, you, you see, you can say whatever you want to say, but you are coming before my God. A holy God. When Adam, I said when Adam and Eve were naked, they hid. You don't respect God. You are coming naked. Hallelujah. And you come with all kinds of unbelievers behind you. People who don't know God. People who have nothing to do with God. That you line them up. The dance that they are... Stop dancing those dances in church. It has nothing to do with God. We are in times that we have to get serious. We are not, we are not in times that we have to dance anyhow. I'm telling you, church is not for entertainment. Church is for serious business. It's for serious people who want to seek the face of God. Who want, 
Look, if God said that it is, especially, and listen to me, in, in Hebrews 10, 25, he says, do not stop meeting together, especially when you see the time approaching. He wants us because he sees that the time is approaching, so we need to meet so we can discuss and think about how we can make it to heaven, how we can walk right, not how we can come and expose ourselves and misbehave in church. And come and have, we, we import everything in the world back to the church. That's not what church is meant for. Church is not meant for that. We are serious here. Amen. I said we are serious here. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Can you go back to uh, uh, Matthew 24? But about the day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, not the son, but only the father. 37. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the son of man. When Noah was talking, people felt it was foolish. Today when we are talking, you say, me Say it. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's trending. I don't know what's fashion. I don't know. I don't need to know what's fashion. Hallelujah. What I need to know is the truth. It's not about the fashion that is going on. What does that fashion look to me? Look, when you die, your fashion doesn't... They can dress you as much as they want and put you in a casket and cover it. Who will see? No, somebody will see. Somebody will see. Aha! Uh-huh. It's moth. Uh, when you go down there, you are going to have a... <laughs> please. Some people will see, but they are not the people you expect to see. Hallelujah. Amen. And they'll have a party. You need to think about, you see, I, I, t- I tell people sometimes, this is not the time to polish the body. I'm not saying don't, don't look nice. Look nice. You see this man looking nice with a bow tie. It's all fine. Look nice. Look nice. Uh, but look nice decently. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You see, I want you to understand that we are in times that you don't have to joke. I see Christians, I look at them, and I'm asking myself a lot of questions. People are, they say, they come in to have a wedding. It's marry. I told you the last time. Marry. It's good. Hallelujah. Amen. No, it's good to marry. It's, it's good. It's good. But marry wisely. Amen. Verse 38. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. When Noah was talking to them, they thought Noah was mad. Today, when your pastor is talking about, about heaven and hell to you, you think your pastor, he doesn't even know what he's talking about. You think, where is he coming from? Since when did Jesus said he was coming? You're not the first person to say that. It's, you, you, let, let's go to Second Peter. I will show you. I will show you something in Second Peter. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, beloved in the Lord. We are in certain times that we have to be very, very serious. But unfortunately, we are not. Hallelujah. <laughs> Let's go to uh, chapter 3. From verse 8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. So the fact that he's not here now doesn't mean he's not coming. It depends on the way you are counting. Yeah, you, you are counting the wrong way. You are counting the wrong way. So you think it's, I mean, 
He said it long ago. But in his county, maybe this is the third day. Hallelujah. And then he goes on to talk about why he's not here. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. He promised that he's coming. And he's not slow in keeping that promise. As some understand slowness. He said, he is what? He's patient with you and with me. Hallelujah. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The Lord is not slow. The Lord is not delaying as you think. He said he will come in and he's not. That, forget about it. He will come. I said he will come. Verse 10 says that. But the, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Whatever you did, I said it will be. I said it will be. I said it will be. So don't think that God is not coming. I said don't think that God is not coming. He is coming. He is coming. And we need to know the times we are in. Look. Today is nearer than yesterday. Today is nearer than yesterday. Is he coming in the next 50 years? I don't know. Is he coming in the next two years? I don't know. What I know is that he's coming. And I will face him. And I have to be prepared. In the days of Noah... Bible says that they were having every kind of party. They were marrying. They were, is marrying wrong? No, it's not wrong. But the way we're going about it, it doesn't make sense. I said it doesn't. Look. Think. Think. And think again. Ask yourself, is what I'm doing pleasing to God. Why are you attacking marriage? I'm not attacking marriage. I'm married. Marriage, marriage is nice. It's sweet. It's good. Amen. And I always tell you that marry. Because it's a good thing. Hallelujah. Amen. There are people if they don't marry, they don't know what left and right is. They, they don't have an idea. They don't. Until they get married. And they realize that everything is not about themselves. There are people, other people involved. And when they, get birth to, they give birth to children, everything changes. Yeah, I want to watch a movie at night. We'll see which, what, what you will listen. Whether you listen to or you watch the movie. Hallelujah. It's very important. You see, that's why I say marry, because you learn a lot. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You learn to deal, thing, deal with things that you don't want to deal with. Somebody's problem becomes your problem. Did you hear that? Yes. She said, oh. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, that, you know, when you are walking around, you think you are on top of the world. Marry. When you marry, you are put in check. It is only when you marry that you know that there is a place to put your shoe. Shoes are not supposed to be put anywhere. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So marry. (laughs) 
I see so much irresponsibility in the youth because they are not married. And you know why they are not married? Because they are doing things married people are supposed to do. And because they are not married, they do it anyhow. They don't understand. They don't understand. And they don't have wisdom to, to understand because it's for married people. Hallelujah. They think they can do anything. Okay, go on. Go ahead. He will come at an unknown time. A time you don't know and a time I don't know. And therefore, we ought to be ready. We have to prepare. And how do we prepare? You see, when you don't know how to prepare, the the first thing is that we don't even know the times we are in. And if you don't know the times we are in, there is no way you are going to know how to prepare. You first have to understand the times. You have to be like the tribe of Issachar. You have to know the times. And Jesus said it several times. And that's why in verse he said that, you, for you, every time is okay. He told his brothers, he said, for you, they said, let's go so that you show off. He said, for you, every time is okay. For many Christians today, every time is okay. Every time is okay to do anything. And they are doing everything. You are not ready for marriage. You go and marry. Every time is okay. Hallelujah. It's not every time that is okay. Look, you have to know when God wants you to take a step. Amen. You have to know. You have to know when God wants you to sign a business. You have to know. You have to know when God wants you to move on. And you know, you see, there are people who have overstayed their time in a place. They, they, you, if you stay for one place for too long, more than what God wanted or what... And we, you see, we don't even ask God about it. How many of us ask God before we take a move? Look at the Israelites. Bible says that until the pillar of cloud move, they can't move. You move anyhow. You move by heart. You just get up, then you are going. Because somebody offered you a be- better uh, salary, you said, I'm going. Do you know what is there? There are times God wants you to stay. Some people moved, they got better salaries and became unbelievers. They forget, about, they forgot about God. But when they were really managing things, they were serious with God. When they saw too much money, something else got into them. The spirit of Mammon, that's, that's his name, entered. They forgot how to serve God anymore. They began to serve Mammon. Timing is important in every Christian's life. I said timing is important. You need to know the times we are in so that you live your life accordingly. We are in times that are dangerous. We are in times that Jesus is coming. But many of us are living our lives like Jesus is not coming anymore. Hallelujah. I said, many of us, we are living our lives like Jesus is not coming anymore. But I want you to understand that he's coming. I said, I want you to understand that he's coming. Whether you think he's not coming or what, it doesn't really matter. What, it is not about what you think. It is about what he has said. And he says that, I am coming soon. I am coming soon. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Revelation chapter 3, verse 3. Mm. Revelation 3, 3. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. I said you will not know at what time I will come to you. And that is why he says that, remember therefore what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. I said, hold it fast and repent. We don't want to talk about repentance anymore. But hold it fast. If you don't repent, you go back to your sin. Hold it fast and repent. Repent and repent and repent. Because the times we are in are dangerous times. They are not times to joke. There are not times to sleep too much. I said there are not times for Christians to think that they can do anything. 
You have to know the times. You have to understand the times. Because if you don't understand, you will do things anyhow. You will do things when you don't have to do. Hallelujah. So, repent. But if you do not wake up, those of you sleeping, I said if you do not wake up, the Bible says I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Chapter 16, same revelation, verse 15. Mm. Yeah. We're getting somewhere now. Look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed, not na- uh, I mean, uh, naked. So as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. Ha! Huh. Look. Those of you who are not looking. Bible says do what? Look. Bible says, she. How do we say it in Ga? Where? What? Where more? How do you say it that way? What? Border. Border. How do you say it in Portuguese? Huh? Levantete. <laughs> Hallelujah. Look. Look. I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake. I said, blessed is the one who stays awake. Many of us are sleeping. But blessed is the one who doesn't sleep, but stays awake. Because he's coming like a thief in the night. And you need to stay awake. Else, there will be trouble. And remain clothed. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. When God told the Israelites that he's going to take them, he said the Passover feast, the meal, that, that meal they ate that night before the angel, of, the angel of death came. He said, when you are eating it, eat it dressed. Eat it dressed because you have to be ready. So we don't eat it like there's nothing at stake. Because there's something at stake and we need to really get ready. You see, Christians are behaving as if there is nothing at stake. We we sit down unconcerned like tomorrow is for us. Tomorrow is not for you. Look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed. So as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. I want us to really be alive. I said, I want you to be alive. Don't be dead. Be alive and awake. First Thessalonians chapter 5. The Lord is coming at an unknown time. But we have to understand the times. So that we can perceive. Hallelujah. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well How many of us know very well the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night and we'll live our lives anyhow? And then we keep postponing it. Oh, tomorrow I'll I'll do it well. Wait, is tomorrow for you? What about if he comes tonight and you are not ready? You know, I, I speak to many Christians and they will admit that they are not ready for the coming of the Lord. But they postpone their own lives and how to live right for God to a later date. When they don't even know whether he's coming right now or this night. I want you to pay attention. You see, many of us are living our lives like God depends on us. God doesn't depend on you. Many of us live our lives like God needs something from us. Let me tell you, God doesn't need anything from you. You need to understand that. What you need to do is to live your life according to his will. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Go on. 
While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly. As labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. They will not. I said they will not. Go to the next verse. Okay. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness. We are awake. We are alive. We are watching. That's what Christians are supposed to do. So Paul is saying that, but you, brothers and sisters, but we here are not in darkness so that this day should surprise us like a thief. If the coming of the Lord surprises you, it's your problem. You've been given enough warning. And this morning, I came, my spirit filled with warnings for you. Because I have to be awake. You have to be awake. We have turned the things of the law to something else. Paul spoke to the Corinthian church. He wrote to them and he said this. And I want you to pay attention. I said I want you to do what? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 19. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. If for this life, what is about this life? What is about this life? That's the question you need to ask yourself. And he's saying, if for only for this life we have hope. If it's not the after, but here and now, that we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. We are of all people most to be pitied. We live our lives today like everything is about here and now. How many of us are focused on the coming of the Lord and where we will spend eternity. Many Christians don't think about that. Many Christians don't think about that. Many of us as Christians are thinking about what we'll eat today, what we'll wear today. What about if you eat today and you are clothed well today and you don't live your life for him, you don't focus on where you are going and you die, where would you be going? I am not saying what to eat is not important. You heard a testimony. She didn't know where, but God provided. God provided. And he always does this. God always does this. He gives beyond your expectation. Probably she was looking for maybe some few thousands of cities. But God just didn't give you. He gave in abundance. From somebody, she wasn't really expecting anything from. If she was even to talk to somebody about her needs or worries, she wouldn't have spoken to that person. But that's where God did, uh, brought it from. So it's not about, you know, he knows where he can get it for you. He knows what he has done in people's life. And when he talks to them, they will obey and then respond. He knows. God knows. If God has not given you anything, he knows he has not given you anything. Beloved, how prepared are you for the second coming of the Lord? Do you really understand the times we are in? 
Do you? Are we really aware? We are in the end times. Jesus spoke about it. And it's about 2,000 years now. By our counting. We don't know God, how God is counting this. And when Jesus is coming. But he says no one knows when he's coming. He says that, look at the signs. The people in Noah's day did not think that what Noah was saying was serious. Some of you don't think what I'm saying is serious. Yeah. Yeah, tear bread. This we have heard <laughs> so many times. I don't dispute that. Yes, I know that you have heard it so many times. I know. But you need to understand that if you don't know and God says that be ready, it means be ready. Don't say that I had it yesterday and he didn't come. So therefore, I lower my guard today. No. Because every day that passes is closer. His, his coming is getting closer and closer. So we need to set up. We need to be aware that he will come. Beloved, what did Jesus himself say in Matthew chapter 24, once again, from verse 42 to 44? I, you see, I am trying to get you to understand that you cannot live your life anyhow. Therefore, therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. These are not anybody's words, but Jesus' words. Jesus says that you and I should keep watch because we don't know on what day the Lord will come. 43. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. 44. So you also must be ready. How many of us are ready for Christ today? Extremely important. If you are not ready, you have to be ready. You can't live your life anyhow, beloved. And you can't deceive yourself that you are ready when you are not ready. You can't. Because he will come. Hallelujah. If you say you are ready and you are not ready, and he comes, you are in trouble. That is why you need to check with your own self whether you are ready. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. If he comes right now, how many of us will be left here and how many of us will go with him? I don't know. I'm supposed to preach to you. I'm supposed to talk to you. But I don't know when he's coming. I'm supposed to get you to be ready. But I don't know when he's coming. Whether he's coming tonight or the next day, I don't know. But I have a question for you this morning. Are you ready? Are you alert? Are you on your guard? Are you prepared for the coming of the Lord? Are you? Are you? What are your priorities? Is it how much money you can make or where you will go after your life on earth? Where? Are you ready for him? Some of us, we are different in church. 
any different outside church. But you know what? He may come at a time that you are not in church. When you are in church, you say you are ready. You are ready on Sundays. But what about Monday? What about if Jesus decides to come on Monday? Are you ready? Sundays we are holy and righteous. What about Monday? How do, how do we live our lives on Mondays? How, how do we live our lives on Saturdays? Saturday night. Hallelujah. Someone told me a story about a friend of hers. He says, we all go to the nightclub on Saturday night. And by 3 a.m., he will say, no, I have to go home. Because tomorrow, I have to go to church. And I have a responsibility in church. He will be with the devil on Saturday night. And Sunday night, he has a responsibility with God. What about if he comes on Saturday night? At that time, you'll be with the devil. Are you saying that nightclub is that? What do you do at the nightclub? You praise God there? You read the Bible at the nightclub? What do you do there? Party house and eating food or something? What do you do? Define it for yourself. And stop asking me questions. Is night, nightclub wrong? The first question you need to ask yourself is what do you do there? And open your Bible and see whether it aligns with your Bible. You, you see, you don't need anybody to tell you anything. You need your Bible to tell you. Your Bible is supposed to tell you. You see, your Bible is not supposed to be closed. He doesn't even have one. He comes to church with his Bible in a bag. He will go home like this. Did he come to church with the Bible? Of course, yes. Did he open it? No. He goes home like, like a precious baby. In the corner. Sunday. My Bible. He comes. Same time. Put it down. Hallelujah. Amen. You are laughing. You ask for you, you don't even have. For him, he asks. But you, you don't even have. Oh, yeah, you have it on the screen. But when they put it on the screen, did you check your Bible whether it's the same? Did you? Because that's what you're supposed to do. That's why you brought the Bible to church. It's not for show. Anyway. So your Bible is supposed to really teach you and help you. Take your Bible in the bag. <laughs> Hallelujah. So this is supposed to guide you. Now, if you want to know whether nightclub is good or bad, Check what you do in the nightclub and find out whether you find it here. And what does the Bible say about it? What does it say about drunkards? What does it say about... What, what else do you do there? Huh? Impurity, debauchery, sexual immorality. Ah, they do that in the nightclub? Okay. You say it again. Ah, he says his Bible says even uh, avoid the appearance. Hallelujah. So when you see nightclub, run away. 
Yeah, that's what avoiding means. Avoiding doesn't mean go near it. He says run away from it. That's, that's what it means. Hallelujah. I want us, you see, I don't want to preach to you something that you don't know about. I want you to, you know, you go to the nightclub. Yeah. You stopped? Hallelujah. Amen. And you, after that, you ask yourself whether to listen to some music is right. Ask who that song is praising. Oh, yeah, but me, it's, it's the one trending. So what? So what? So what? Trending for the devil. And you want to follow what is trending for the devil? We are in very dangerous times and you don't even realize it. You are not even aware. You don't understand the times we are in. You have forgotten that the devil is actively working in this time, looking for as many people as he can destroy. You have forgotten about that. In fact, some even have not forgotten. They don't even know, let alone understand. You are so, so, so inclined for money. Everything is about money. And you say, yeah, but even if there's no money, how can you run the church? What? She was broke. God was not broke. You heard her? So I was broke like what? Lapa. But God was not broke. And God is not broke. And God will never be broke. Hallelujah. So if you are thinking, yeah, but the church also needs money. Of course, the church needs money, but God knows how to give to the church. He knows. I want the church to understand that God knows how to keep. He said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Yeah, but you see, when God wanted to build the church in those times, he asked people to bring. He knows what he had given to them. Amen. And they brought. Hallelujah. Amen. If God, you see, she didn't ask any, anyone for anything. But the person said that she was in her house in Europe. This woman is living in Ghana. And the Lord told her in Europe when she prayed. He says, the first thing is that she said, I have never prayed for you. So I don't even understand why it came to my mind to pray for you this day. Then she started praying. And God said, point of expense. What kind of English is that? Point of expense. What is point of expense? I don't understand God. God said, give her this amount of money. Can God ask you to give that kind of amount? No, he won't. Because you don't have, he hasn't given you that. If God tells you to give, it means that he has told you, uh, he has given to you. He knows, what, you see, you have many friends, why did you go to that one? Why? If God had come to you, you know, you are, I know he comes to you to talk a lot. Uh-huh. So he's, he's your friend. Did God tell him? Hallelujah. You see, the people in Israel in Jesus' time were so wicked. When Jesus needed money, he sent Peter to a fish. He sent Peter to a fish. Look, if God wants to build his church, he can go to a fish. He sent Peter to a fish. Go and catch a fish and bring the money in his mouth. Look, which God do you say? You know what bothers me? is when Christians behave as if God is broke. Do 
And when, I'm sorry, but I have to say, when pastors begin to beg congregations for money, it makes me feel sad. Beg. You know, we have to do this, and you have to do that, and you have to do that. So please, please, I won't ask you please to bring money down. I'll tell you what the Bible says and leave it with you. Make your own decision. Nobody should beg anybody for money for God. When God told the Israelites, he said that anyone that feels in his heart to give, give. Hallelujah. God is never broke. He gives you and he tells you that you are still what? What do you have that you did not receive? You are still what? Hallelujah. If you understand the times we are in, you will not follow money. You will follow Jesus. I said you will not follow money. You will follow Jesus. It looks like my time is up somehow. Hallelujah. I need to continue next week. Because we need to understand certain things. We need to understand certain things. The church is going wayward. The church has turned things around. We are not focused on what we're supposed to focus on. This place is not for entertainment. No. This place is not to make you feel good. This place is meant to draw you closer to God. And if you, sometimes when you get to God, you are uncomfortable. It's not every time that you, are, you feel good in the presence of God. You are uncomfortable. Because when you begin to see God and you see your nakedness and you see your weakness and you see how wrong you are and you see where your end is, you are sad. People say, yeah, but I came to church to feel good and then the things you say, it doesn't make me feel good in church. Huh? <laughs> you don't know why you, should, you are in church. When Isaiah's faults were exposed to him, when he encountered God, he begged God. Do you know what happened? Let me t- you see, you need to read your Bible. Isaiah chapter 6. Do you know what happened? God, God, God came and he says, Oh, Isaiah. Ah, Isaiah. Isaiah. You see, you are nice. You are, no. And they were calling to one another, Holy, 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 Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now move on, yeah. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. The moment it happened, he said, Woe to me, I cried, I'm ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Go on, go on, quickly, flow with me. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongues from the altar. With it, Sometimes when you come to church, you need fire. You see, people want to be pampered. And, but you see, you didn't speak to me well. God didn't speak to Isaiah well. He brought fire. The, if it, listen to me carefully. Go back, go back, go back. Go back one verse. Then one of the seraphim, seraphim is not a human being, flew to me with a live coal, a live coal in his hand, which he had taken Wait, what? Not this old. It's like, let me say, like, like something like Kalipa or something. No, I mean, so, what, what, what would I say? Maybe, what? Maybe Playa or something. I mean, I want something that will make it easy for you. Because we, we are, we don't, many of us don't know tongues. But that's what he brought. It's like this. Listen to me. You see, I want you to listen to me carefully because 
You have read it so many times, but you haven't paid attention. I want you to pay attention this morning. Even the angel couldn't touch the fire with his hand. Even the or no crowds or angel or the tongues in the fire. Or the tongues in the fire. When he came, he put it here. Listen, something that is so hot. And you tell me what? You have to feel good. Aha, uh-huh, this is tongue. You see? And the angel couldn't touch it with, the, with his hands. So, on the crow to it too. Even seraphim that can fly couldn't take it with his. Because he, can you fly? So, he has some power you don't have. Even he, he couldn't touch it. He used tongues to pick it. And when he got there, he touched Isaiah's lips with raw fire. Now tell me Isaiah was comfortable. Tell me. Isaiah was comfortable. Where was he? In the temple. He was in church like you are. And tell me, and when I came to church, the things you are saying, you see, me, I came to church to feel good. And the things you are saying, if instead of you talking about something that will make me feel all right, you are talking about hell, 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 hell. What do you want me to do? Do you want to go there? I need to warn you today. So that you feel uncomfortable in your seat, that I don't want to go there. How many of us are going to hell? God knows you, whether you are going... You see, sometimes we have to tell you the truth. Why, why many of you think that if Jesus comes today, they will go to hell? Lift up your hands. Hell? Yeah, good, good, yeah, good, yeah. Good, yeah. Mm-hmm. The rest, where are you going? If Jesus come right now, where will you go? Heaven or hell? Heaven, lift up your hands. So I assume the rest are going to hell. You have to be sure. If you are not sure, then it's hell. You don't know where you are going. How, many, how long have you been in church? And all these years, you still don't know where you are going. You have to know. You have to know. You have to be assured. Hallelujah. So that you can continue the process that you are in. If Jesus comes today and you don't know where you are going, then that's a big problem. We need to know. We need to be ready. How would you be ready when you don't know where you are going? Then it means you are not ready. If I ask you, when are you going home and you say, or where are you going from here? And he says, I don't know. <coughs> How can you be ready? Because if you, if, like for example, if you are going to swim in the sea from here, then it means that you have, you're swimming something around you. And then, so if you, if you don't know where you are going, and then from here you go to the beach. How are you going to, going to swim with your tie and jacket and everything? So you need to, you need to have an idea. Amen. 